Hi everybody, welcome to lecture number 17, video 3. We just um, reviewed cycles and then looked at a specific cycle, the ranking cycle. Now in this third video we're going to look at heat pumps and refrigerators. So what is a heat pump? We learned about heat engines, what is a heat pump? Well a heat pump is a device and it's going to use energy or work so it's going to do work in order to move heat well moving heat's easy you just get something hot it goes from hot to cold but this moves heat in the opposite direction you would expect from cold to hot so this doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics because we're putting in energy in order to move the heat the wrong direction so everything is still okay. Physics is not broken. So again, if you have a normal system, let's say a hot cup of hot chocolate sitting on your countertop, then that hot cup of chocolate is kind of like a heat source. And it is moving, heat is moving from the hot thing to the cold thing. That is how nature and anything in nature always works. A heat pump, however, can change that direction. So if we've got a hot region and a cold region, we can put a heat pump into this system and instead of heat moving from hot to cold, we can cause heat to move from cold to hot. In order to do that though, we have to put in some work. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some specific terminology. A heat pump, whenever someone says a heat pump, they're talking about something whose job it is to move heat into a heated space. When we talk about a refrigerator, we're talking about a thing whose job it is to remove heat from a cold space. So heat pump pumps heat into a hot space. Refrigerator removes heat from a cold space. All right, so um, this we're going to talk about the vapor compression cycle today, which is the main most popular cycle used in refrigerators and heat pumps. Uh, the working fluid is some kind of refrigerant, R134A, HFCs, these are actually being phased out for more environmentally friendly options. Still trying to figure out exactly what that is. <laughs> so we're going to learn the vapor compression cycle today. So let's get right into that. The cycle. Okay, so this, as you expect, since... Um, well, let's just talk about it real quick. Uh, the vapor compression cycle, which I'll call the VC cycle, is just like the ranking cycle kind of but in reverse there are there's one different piece of equipment but a lot of the um, processes are similar um, again I'm going to draw kind of a diagram describing our uh, the equipment used and then what process is done in each equipment and then how that all works as a cycle in order to accomplish um, refrigeration or the pumping of heat. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw all these out real quick and then talk about them. Okay, the vapor compression cycle. Uh, our first component is a compressor. Again, we'll talk about each of these individually. We're just gonna name them for now. Where you put in work and you pressurize a vapor, actually. Okay, we have here an evaporator. So here now is our low temperature side. And unlike before, we're actually now moving heat from the low temperature into our heat pump. Uh, now, this, uh, compared to our last video, fluid is actually moving in the opposite direction. It's going this way around our cycle. Okay, and so the evaporator evaporates our liquid into a vapor before it goes into the compressor and absorbs heat from the cold space. This is an expansion valve. 
We'll talk about exactly what that does, but essentially the point is to drop the pressure of the fluid and cause the temperature of the fluid to drop dramatically. That Because if we're going to transfer heat from TL to the evaporator, the temperature of the evaporator must be really cold in order for heat to go from TL to TEVAP. <clears throat> okay, our last component is the condenser. The condenser rejects that heat to our hot temperature uh, sink. Um, it condenses a vapor leaving the compressor into a liquid, which means that the temperature of the condenser must be really, really hot in order for heat to move from T condenser to T hot. So that's really how we're not breaking any laws of physics. We just cause a working fluid, which is going in this cycle, to get really hot and then really cold, enabling heat to move from TL to T VAP and then from T condenser to T hot. All right, let's talk about each process and component individually. So we'll start with process number one, the compressor, which is similar to the pump in the ranking cycle. Okay, but here we are talking about a compressor. Uh, a pump com um, increases the pressure of a liquid. A compressor increases the pressure of a vapor. So our fluid enters our compressor as a vapor, not a liquid. Um, and then the pressure of our vapor increases as the compressor does work on our fluid. So we have low pressure fluid entering our compressor and we have high pressure fluid leaving our compressor where fluid is entering here and exiting here. It does that in almost exactly the same way a turbine would, but working in reverse. We power this shaft, so we put work in maybe with a motor, and we spin a shaft that has a lot of veins, and these veins turn and do work on the fluid, causing it to flow. And as it flows, the area gets smaller, compressing the fluid into a smaller space, causing the pressure to increase. Since it's a vapor, you can squish that vapor Imagine a piston full of air. You could push down on it, causing the pressure to go up and the density of the air to increase. Okay? So it's the reverse of a turbine. And like we've already mentioned, it requires work. You can't compress air for nothing. You've, you've got to put in energy because compressed air has more energy than uncompressed air. So that energy has to come from somewhere. That energy is coming from our spinning shaft. All right, so that was the first one. Here is our process number two, the condenser. Okay, I've pictured down here a condenser of a standard air conditioning system because you've all seen these before and wondered what the heck they are. Well, this is a condenser. Let's talk about exactly what it does. Okay, so a condenser is on the high pressure side, right? So it's right here, okay? And the condenser, the hot fluid, because remember, we compressed the fluid here in our compressor, and as we compressed it, the temperature also went up. And so we've got hot fluid flowing through our condenser. And as it flows through the condenser, it's exposed to some relatively cool surroundings. I say relatively cool because it's actually hot surroundings. It's T hot, but the fluid in the condenser is very hot. And so our hot vapor is exposed to TH. And when we do that, then energy leaves the fluid and flows into TH. Okay, which means that, remember we had a vapor, as we allow energy to leave the vapor, then the temperature drops until we reach 
um, the boiling temperature, and then it begins to condense, turn back into a fluid, a liquid, I'm sorry. And so then the fluid actually leaves as a liquid, what we call a saturated liquid. So if you heat up water on the stove until it's at boiling point, then that is a saturated liquid. And that is what is leaving our condenser. Okay. Uh, we also say this is a constant pressure process. So the pressure of our fluid, we will say, is not dropping. This is the ideal cycle. The pressure will drop, but for now we're saying it won't. Okay, so on your air conditioner, uh, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but here's T hot, right? You've got your house, and it's cold, and you've rejected heat into your working fluid, which is now flowing into this condenser and there's a bunch of tubes in here that run around the whole outside and this the heat in the tubes um, is exposed to th and because the fluid in the tubes is really hot the energy from the fluid is actually rejected into th so this is the condenser of your air conditioner All right, let's talk about the third process, the expansion valve. Okay, remember the expansion valve is right here after the condenser. So after the condenser, we have a saturated liquid, right? And our saturated liquid is going to enter this expansion valve. And we have a problem, right? We need to somehow absorb heat from our cold space but we need our fluid to be really cold in order for that to happen so what an expansion valve is is often it's just a tiny hole or a very very thin tube that's really long and all we're doing is we're allowing the high pressure fluid which was pressurized by the compressor to build up and then that high pressure fluid is squeezed out of this tiny tube. And on the other side of that tiny hole is a low pressure region. And so as our saturated liquid enters a low pressure area, um, then we actually cause the boiling point to go down and we now flash this fluid into a vapor. So we cause the temperature to drop significantly. So we push a liquid through a small hole. We'll just say through an opening because it could be a very thin, long tube. Um, and this causes the pressure to drop. So this is the opposite, kind of the opposite of our compressor. Now in the Rankine cycle, the equivalent of this was a turbine. That's when we extracted work, right? And in theory, you could put a turbine here in order to extract some work from your fluid that you put into your compressor. And that would still cause the pressure and temperature of your vapor to drop. But since um, refrigeration cycles generally are very small, like for a refrigerator or just an air conditioner, it's actually not worth it to put a turbine there. Not to mention, uh, this is going from a saturated liquid to a mixture of vapor and liquid, and that's really hard to put through any sort of turbine. There's really no turbine for a mixture of vapor and liquid. So we just waste that energy, allow it to kind of destroy itself by trying to push a liquid through a small hole. And this causes the, temper, the temperature to drop significantly, and that's the important point we now have a very low temperature here um, on the downstream side of this thing and that's when we go to our last process the evaporator which is after the expansion valve um, so our evaporator is on the low pressure side which means our fluid right after the expansion valve remember is very cold and so we're flowing through this evaporator which is exposed to our low temperature region 
but because we flashed our vapor, our liquid into a vapor and caused the temperature to drop significantly, the temperature of our evaporator is quite low. So heat transfers from our low temperature space to our T evaporator. Okay, so our fluid is exposed um, to the relatively hot TL. Um, energy is absorbed because of heat transfer. And then it's an evaporator because now our fluid is, remember, entering a liquid vapor mixture. But as we pass through the evaporator and heat is added, that liquid boils into a vapor and we leave entirely as a vapor. Okay, and we also call this a constant pressure process. In reality, it will not be so, but we're going to say it's close for this ideal model of a vapor compression cycle. Okay, so now let's do a quick energy balance on an entire system just to come up with some indicators, something like efficiency we can use to quantify how well our system is working. So remember, a heat pump in the opposite of a heat engine is moving heat against a temperature gradient from TL to TH. And in order to do that, since that would by itself violate the second law, we must put in work. Okay, so if we draw our control volume as our heat pump, then we can simply say that Q, uh, the energy leaving QH must be equal to the energy entering or QL plus the work in which is nice if you're trying to do a heat pump, the work you're putting in is actually turned eventually into thermal energy and goes into your space. So in a way, the energy you add isn't really wasted. It's still used as heat and it's used to move additional heat from a cold space to a hot space. The end result is the efficiency of your system actually um, isn't, since we're not looking for work over energy in, we're instead looking for a heat rate compared to the amount of work we have to put in, um, we're going to um, define a term called the coefficient of performance, the COP of our system. And this can be and should be greater than one. Okay, um, so the coefficient of performance of our heat pump defined just like um, efficiency is what you want over what you have to put in. So a heat pump, remember, is moving heat into a hot space, QH. So what we want is QH. What we have to put in is work. So the coefficient of performance of a heat pump is QH over work in. Now a refrigerator has a slightly different definition because what we want is to move heat away from a cold space. So we want QL and we have to put in work to do it. So that's the COP of a refrigerator. Now COP can and should be greater than one. If it's less than one, then that means the amount of heat you were able to move was less even than the work you put in, which means it would have been better to just take that work and instead turn it straight into thermal energy and turn it straight into heat. And you would have actually done better than your heat pump did. So your coefficient of performance should be greater than one, can be on the order of three to six. Okay, um, as a final note, I wanted to talk about what a heat pump in a home looks like and kind of how it be performs based on the season. So in the summertime, here's your house, and here is the condenser at least that's what it's called in the summertime, right? So when you, in the summer, a heat pump system behaves just like an air conditioning system. So you have a cold space being your house. You want it to stay cold, right? And you have a hot space, which is the outside. It's hot because that is what the outside does. So you have an evaporator inside your house. Generally, it's built into your 
um, central cooling system and heat is moved from your house into the evaporator into the working fluid which then goes outside and rejects that heat from the condenser into the surroundings so this is a, how a heat pump would work in the summer just like an air conditioner we all anyone who has an air conditioner has a heat pump in summer mode but then when winter rolls around, you don't want your house to be the cold space anymore, right? Now, the outside has turned into the cold space. And your house, you would really like to be the hot space. So, you still have the same components. You don't go drag your condenser into your house uh, in the winter time. That would be entertaining to watch. But now, we actually just reverse the direction of flow. So now we um, change the way things are running and we have a condenser and an evaporator. And so our condenser now is rejecting heat from the working fluid into the hot space and our evaporator is absorbing heat um, from the surroundings and putting that heat into the working fluid which then goes into the condenser and rejects that to your house. Um, likewise, a refrigerator operates just like an air conditioner. In fact, we're going to erase this now and write refrigerator. A refrigerator, instead of a house, we have your refrigerator. So here is your fridge. Here's the inside of your fridge. You have built into your fridge walls uh, some tubes which absorb the cold space. And then you reject that heat to the condenser, which is the tubes on the back of your fridge or on the bottom of your fridge and that heat is rejected into the hot space being your own home okay so that's how a heat pump um, which can manifest as um, an air conditioning system or a refrigerator those are types of heat pumps when we talk about a heat pump of a home we're talking about a reversible system where the outside and inside components can act as condensers or evaporators uh, we're going to talk about heat pumps, especially when we talk about geothermal, because now instead of using the ground as our hot or cold, I'm sorry, the air as our hot or cold space, we'll now use the ground as our sink or our source. Okay.